once you think you have the real problem, then the next stage would be, what should I expect now that I know the real problem? Like, what should I expect knowing that the student has lost a father or the girl has terrible working memory or the student grew up in poverty? What should I expect? Well, the first thing to understand is that DNA is not our destiny. When they don't arrive at school with their DNA preassembled, throw that out. DNA contributes a portion of how we turn out, but not 100%. And why is that? It's because environment can influence whether genes are activated or suppressed. And this is this new science of epigenetics, E-P-I-G-E-N-E-T-I-C-X. So epigenetics means that the environment influences whether genes are acting the way we expect them to behave. So they get glued together by life experiences. So here's a student. It's actually a real person. Alonzo Clemens suffered brain damage as a result of a fall as a child. In school, he could not read, write, nor do math. IQ, 40 to 50. Unable to tie his own shoes or eat by himself. So if he was a student that came to you or in your class, what kind of expectations should you have for him? What goals would you have set for him? What, what, what questions would you ask of this student? So write down goals or expectations. If you have someone with you, go ahead and talk over what would you expect. All right, pause for a moment. I never had a student like this, and I don't know what I would have done. Today, I'm different, but at that time, I don't know if I would have kept expectations high. Because when you see someone that almost sits there like a vegetable, you're thinking, oh boy, I got my work cut out for me. Now, you might be one who works with special needs students, and you see students like this often. But I know just for myself, I would have had a tough time setting high expectations. And that would have been a big, big mistake. Because would you really have expected this student to become rich, famous, and be in the Olympics and be on the Discovery Channel in 60 minutes? Because that's exactly how his life turned out. Read the next slide. By the way, you can buy the sculptures that he does, and they are at his website, longzoclemens.com. His sculptures sell all over the world. He has an uncanny ability to be able to sculpt with his hands. And the reason I bring this up is because you should know the million-dollar question to ask students when you have students who are struggling. This is the question that a savvy teacher would ask. What do you like to do? You see, Alonzo Clemens, what he liked to do is work with his hands. What he liked to do is make things. Give him a piece of clay, and he could do a sculpture. That was the million-dollar question. When a teacher asked that and he showed what he could do, everything changed. His whole life changed. Never, ever think you should set low expectations. Ask the student, what do you like to do? So how do you boost high expectations or build them. One is show students other students. Show them this is what other kids your age do. And when you work with other students, here's a good chance that they are a good prediction. They don't go home at night and Google the phrase high-performing adolescence. They don't Google that. You be the one that shows up and shows them what students can do that's amazing. Up at the top of the screen is Dylan Mallingham, who by age nine was speaking in front of the United Nations, and he has 24,000 student volunteers around the world. Or Alexandra Scott, that raised over a million dollars for brain research. Or Katie Stagliano, that started up a company 
called Katie's Crops because of an idea she got when she's 12 years old by donating vegetables to the homeless. What were you doing at age 9, age 4, age 12? This is what adolescents can do around the world. The reason this is important to ask is because your mindset has to be, listen, brains can change. Change can be for the worse on the left-hand side of the screen. We call it maladaptive. Or they can be for the better on the right, adaptive, such as skills training or enrichment. Those are positive changes using what we call neuroplasticity. So understanding that the brain can change is powerful. In this study, the pre and the post exams were using MRIs. So as you know, an MRI is a soft tissue x-ray of the brain. What the MRI showed is that by reading, it was altering the brain. It actually strengthened and enlarged pathways in the brain, in the axon tissues. In this case, the student on the far left had in this pre-fMRI, which is active imaging, top-down view, had activity in the wrong places of the brain to do well. But 12 weeks later, after the fast-forward program, you see that his brain was altered and the student became a decent reader. And that's powerful because it only took a short amount of time, and now his brain's using a different part of his brain. That's pretty impressive. And teaching vocabulary to students. Scientists not just found where vocabulary shows up in the brain, but they found that increased vocabulary added gray matter density, and increased gray matter density increased, and it was correlated with higher test scores. Bottom line is, brains can change, and they can change cognitively. So the old myth is that when you have a struggling student, that their IQ is what their IQ is going to be. Throw that out. That's old. That's not current science. In this study, 65 low-income children, low socioeconomic status children, were adopted between ages 4 and 6. All of them had an IQ, a full standard deviation, below what would be considered typical before adoption. Eight years later, they were retested. The average gain was about 14 IQ points. In other words, IQ is not fixed. It can be raised through enriching environment. Core understanding here is a critical one. When you have others around you that think student achievement is mostly due to luck or it's due to genes, that's not true. The circumstances around them and the teaching actually turns out to be a big deal. But what about the genes? It turns out that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Sorry about that. It turns out that if you are middle class or upper class, the genetic heritability in you of the IQ of your parents is high, 60 to 80% likelihood it's going to happen. But if your parents are poor, the heritability of IQ is low, it's under 10%. What does this actually mean at your school with a struggling student? It means you can't have... Any teacher say, well, I know just how this kid's going to turn out. I taught his daddy 20 years ago, and he wasn't very bright. Actually, if the student is poor, you don't know much at all. The heritability of the IQ is very low. I emailed the researchers to make sure I understood the study correctly, as I often do, and they said the same thing I was thinking. I was thinking... You can't get a good read on a student's IQ if the student comes from poverty, on the heritability of the IQ. So what does this actually mean? It means that anybody at your school that is pointing fingers and saying, it's, we can't change him, it can't be done, you can't do it, that mindset is a terrible mindset. You want to have the no excuses mindset. Anybody can point fingers at other things like, oh, the last teacher, oh, this, oh, that. But four-year-olds point fingers. You be the one that says, what can we do? After all, DNA is not your destiny. 